Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Good to have everybody back with us again, and uh, this is our program number four for this afternoon, and uh, then we'll be dismissed, and we'll see you again next month. And uh, for those of you out in television, if you ever find your way through Tulsa and you're in the area on the first Wednesday after the first Sunday, we'll, Lord willing, be taping. And uh, you just feel free to come in and uh, spend an afternoon with us. I guess I always have to announce, because we constantly have new listeners, that all the past programs are available on uh, videotape, audio tape, and the little printed books there, they're on the screen. And uh, Jerry Poole is with us again today, and uh, he does all of our transcribing, takes it off the tapes, and uh, gets it ready for Keith Decker, who I guess does some proofreading and gets it all on the floppy disk and ready for the printer. So it's a uh, teamwork, really, everybody working together. And uh, we just thank the Lord daily for everyone that has come in to be a part of this ministry. Again, I like to thank every one of you for all your letters. I am still able to read every letter. Uh, you know, as it gets larger and larger, that'll get tougher and tougher to do. But so far, Iris and I both, we read every letter that comes in, and uh, I open every, every uh, envelope, whether it's a check or a letter, whatever, we see it all. And uh, hopefully I can answer most of your questions. Now, I may get behind once in a while, for if I don't answer for a little bit, don't give up on me, but uh, one will hopefully be forthcoming. Also, we have been announcing now the last several programs that we are now putting out a newsletter about every three months in which uh, we just have a few uh, words concerning current events and prophecy. And uh, we like to let people know where we are having seminars and so forth. But uh, if you're interested, we don't want to mail them out unless you want one. You uh, call us or write us, and we'll get you on the mailing list. All right, time's a-flying. we got to get back into the book. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off in the last program. And we were, for starters, we're still in Ephesians 1, verse 10. And so we'll go back there for a moment to kick us off. And then we will uh, continue on where we were in the earthly and the heavenly concepts of Scripture. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1, and again let me go back up to verse 8 and 9 so we get the flow. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery or the secret of his will, which we saw several programs back. God has a right to keep everything secret. He can reveal it when he's good and ready and not until. And uh, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. In other words, as I've said several times this afternoon, everything begins and ends with and in God. He got everything started. He created everything. He set everything in motion, and he's going to bring it to his own end. That's why I have taught for 25 years that the world is not going to be blown up with nuclear bombs until God is ready to do it himself. Now, I do not deny that there will be nuclear warfare in the tribulation, but it's not going to happen until God is ready to let it all happen. And so I have been comfortable over the years with teaching people that we're not going to be blown up with nuclear warheads because it just does not fit with the end time scenario. But whatever. Now we come down to verse 10 where we spent the beginning of the last, uh, the first part of the verse in our last half hour. <clears throat> that in the dispensation or that period of time of the fullness of times, which I feel is the thousand year millennial reign on the earth, that this fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both. So again, both indicates how many entities? Two. Both doesn't mean three or four. It means two. All right, so he's going to bring all things in Christ, both of which are in heaven and on the earth, even in him. Now then, we took the concept in our last half hour that these are the two spheres that God has been dealing with ever since the beginning of human history. 
We went back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And you can keep those two things separated all through Scripture. And you can't mix them because the heavenly thing is that which was revealed to the Apostle Paul in the mysteries, the body of Christ. We are the heavenly connection. All the rest of God's history is earthly. The nation of Israel and all that went around them are earthly. And when Israel rejected everything, then God turned to the Gentiles and began to work in the heavenly. Now, we really didn't finish the earthy, earthly concept of it, and I guess I should put it up on the board now that beginning with the call of Abraham, and we had the nation of Israel. You've seen me put this on the board over and over, and people comment on it. They, they like this as much as anything I guess I teach. And an uh, Israel, uh, Irish reminded me that this little timeline, in, in simplified form, of course, is in every one of our little books. So if you have our books, why, you just look into the front page and you'll see the same timeline. But anyway, 2000 BC, God pulls off the little nation of Israel and he begins his earthly ministry only to the Jew, with two exceptions. It's all nation of Israel. Don't ever try to tell some, let somebody tell you that Christ ministered to Gentiles because he did not. He ministered only to the nation of Israel. And I guess I better show the verse so I can back it up. Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> because so many people get confused by the false teaching that Jesus ministered to Jew and Gentile. No, he did not. He couldn't because he came to the nation of Israel in the earthly promises of the covenant made with Abraham, and then the later covenants. Under that Abrahamic covenant were the Davidic, the Mosaic, the Palestinian, as we call it, because it was referring to the land of Palestine. In fact, someone said, why do I use the word Palestine? Well, it's in the scripture, only once, but it is in there, and uh, it refers to it as the land of Palestine. And so I use the term only because of its geographical clarity. We all know where Palestine is if we don't know anything else. But all right, Matthew chapter 10. Jesus has just called out the 12 disciples, as we call them, or the, the apostles. Verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans who were half-breeds. Enter you not. But here was the command, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, God's earthly people. And so Christ's earthly ministry was confined to his earthly people, Israel, and there were only two exceptions, and I'll show you one right now, and it's right in chapter uh, is it 11, I thought it was, 13, 15. People wonder sometimes, well, how do you remember these portions of Scripture? Well, I just know it's an odd number chapter, so if it isn't in 13, I'm sure it's got to be in 15. Yeah, here it is. Okay, Matthew 15, dropping down to verse 21. And you all know the account. I think everybody out in television knows it. But you probably don't understand the ramification of it. Verse 21 of Matthew 15, And Jesus went thence and departed into the borders of Tyre and Sidon. Now Tyre and Sidon were up there on the Mediterranean sea coast, and the area what we now know of as Lebanon. And it was two Gentile cities. But he doesn't go into Tyre and Sidon so much as he comes out into the border area. And so he's in the border area of these two Gentile cities. In verse 22, a woman of Canaan, a Gentile, came out of that same border area and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil or a demon. <clears throat> but, verse 23, he, Lord Jesus himself, 
answered her not a word. Now what does that imply? He ignored her. Yeah, he ignored her. He just didn't pay her any mind. Why? She's a Gentile. He has a ministry only to the nation of Israel. And so he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and they begged him saying, Send her away. Get rid of her. For she crieth after us. Now this had no doubt been going on for several days. Every place they went, here was this Canaanite woman, probably making a nuisance of herself. And so the disciples were getting kind of out of sorts, and they said, Lord, she's a Gentile. We don't have anything to do with her. Get rid of her. Send her away. Well, you see, the Lord has got something else on his mind. And so verse 24, he answers, of course, to the twelve, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See how plain that is? Now, in plain English, what he's saying, I do not have a ministry except to the Jew. That's what he said in Matthew 10, and now he's saying it again. I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, in a matter of moments or hours, here she is again. And she came and worshipped him. Now, I think she had literally fell down on her knees in front of him. And she says, Lord, help me. Now, you got to be a little aware of what's going on here. She drops the term, thou son of David, because that was strictly a Jewish address. So as a Gentile, she couldn't use that legitimately. So she learned something anyway. And so she dropped the son of David bit. But now she just says, Lord, help me. And again, look at Jesus' answer. And he said unto her, it is not meet or right to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Well, who were the children? Israel, the Jews. Who were the dogs? Gentiles. He says, I can't take that which is on the table of Israel and give it to Gentiles. Why? Covenant promises. See? He was there to fulfill the covenants made back here to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all the prophets were all dealing with God, prophesying things concerning Israel and the coming of their Messiah. And there's not a word in there that the Gentiles were to receive any of the blessings of Israel. They couldn't because it was covenant ground and that was only for the offspring of Abraham. All right, so here it is. I cannot take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now this again, I wish I had a little more time, but I'm going to take a moment or two. You go back into Psalms 23, and uh, you're probably like I am. You almost have to start at the beginning and go on through. But he said, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Thou settest a what? A table before me. Now, what was the table he was referring to? This place of privilege that only Israel could enjoy, they literally feasted at the Lord's table. How? They had the Word of God. See? Now, you're looking at me kind of blank. Keep your hand in here. Romans. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And this is exactly what it meant that they were feasting at the Lord's table because of their covenant position. And you can pick this up in various other places of Scripture, that we Gentiles were never feasting at the Lord's table when God was dealing with Israel. Today, of course, yes, we're in that place of privilege, but back here it's only the Jew. All right, Romans chapter 3. I said two, didn't I? Chapter 3, verse 1. Romans 3, verse 1. And Paul says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? In other words, what benefit is it to be a member of the nation of Israel? Oh, verse 2. Much. Every way. Now, what are the every way? Well, they had the temple. They had the priesthood. They had the sacrifices. They had the prescribed approach to Jehovah. They had the geographical area of land that God had deeded to Abraham 2,000 years before. They had everything going for them. 
they had the miracles of the Red Sea and of the manna and of the tables of stone. And you come all the way up through the Old Testament. God was constantly working in the nations of Israel with miracles. So they had a lot of things going for them. But chiefly, what was their number one blessing? That unto them were committed the word of God. See, that's what has blessed America in the last 200 years above all the nations of the world. America, up until the last 50 years, rested on this book. We know it did. All of our forefathers were believers of this book. Now, they might not have been what we would call born-again Christian, but at least they were men enough to admit that America operated on the principles of this book. All right, now that was Israel's blessing. They had the word of God. See that? All right, now flip back again to Matthew. So this was the table at which the Jews were able to literally feast the word of God. And they were a privileged people. Read right on. I can't take the children's bread, verse 26, and cast it to the dogs, but she comes back and says, Truth, Lord. In other words, she recognized that. But she said, Don't the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table? And then he answered and said, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thy will. And her daughter was made whole from the fairy hour. In other words, he could heal a Gentile if he wanted to. But see, he was under the sovereign agreement with Israel and Israel. Abraham and the covenant promises that he could not pour out grace to Gentiles until Israel had every opportunity to hear the offer of the king and the kingdom. And when they rejected it, yes, then God turns to the, to the Gentile world. All right, but I'm not quite ready to leave off with the earthly aspect of Ephesians 1.10, and we're not going to even get much further than the earthly, and we'll pick that up in our next taping, in our next program. All right, let's go back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And this sort of substantiates what I've just said, that God could not break his covenant promises with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Matthew chapter 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Remember what the Syrophoenician woman said, thou son of David? The son of Abraham. And that's as far as it goes. It doesn't go on back to Adam. It only goes from Christ's birth back to Abraham. And you know, I'm always raising the question, why? There's a reason for it. Because Matthew is going to present him as the king of the nation of Israel, Israel's Messiah, Matthew is going to present him as the fulfillment of these covenant promises made to Abraham. And so there's no need to go any further back because this is where everything begins so far as Israel is concerned. And so it only goes to Abraham. All right, now then, if you'll come back from there and come up to chapter 3 once again, now we find that Jesus' birth has been recorded. And John the Baptist is beginning to announce the coming of the king. And verse 2 of chapter 3, Matthew 3, verse 2. And this is John the Baptist's message. See this? And he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, now that doesn't sound earthly, does it? It sounds heavenly. But, where was this heavenly kingdom going to be? On the earth. All the things that we've seen in the Old Testament was that this glorious kingdom is going to be on the earth, but it's going to be heaven on earth because Christ is going to be the king. And so the whole concept now is that the king is in the midst of Israel. They are being offered the opportunity to enter into all these earthly promises which are going to come to fruition. But, of course, even according to Ephesians 1.10, that couldn't happen until the Gentile complement had also been completed, which was the church, because when we enter into the kingdom economy, like it said in 1.10, everything is going to come under Christ's headship. The earthly people of Israel 
and their earthly kingdom and all the ramifications of the heavenly people, the body of Christ. All right, so we're going to leave the body of Christ, at least for now, uh, for a later time, and come with me a little further in Matthew. Let's go to chapter 19. I didn't intend to do this. Believe me, I didn't. So I'm having to think real fast as we go. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Verse 27. Here we are in his earthly ministry. And oh, he's been proclaiming to the nation of Israel that he is the Messiah, the Christ. And he's been proving it with miracle and signs and wonders. All right, verse 27 of Matthew 19. Then answered Peter, and he said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? In other words, for following you. Well, he's not talking about salvation because that was established back in chapter 60 when Peter says, Thou art the Christ. All right, so now what Peter is saying, much like Abraham did back in Genesis 15, God promised him the land and he promised him all these other things and then the great man of faith still said what? How do I know? How do I know you're going to give me the land? Well, then the Lord says, okay, let's, let's make out a title deed. Well, Peter's the same way. The Lord just got through telling him a few weeks before this that, blessed art thou, Peter, because you have recognized who I am. See? All right, but now Peter comes back and says, well, what else are we going to have? See? Oh, they're so human. So human. Ah, right. does Jesus dress him down? No. No, Jesus answers and he says, Verily I say unto you, that you who have followed me, in other words, speaking of Peter, and uh, we're going to leave Judas out, so it would be Peter and the other ten, you who have followed me, comma, in the regeneration, in other words, when the earth is brought back and made like it was in the Garden of Eden, that's what regenerate means, when you make it like it was before, so when the regeneration is accomplished and the earth is made like it was in the Garden of Eden, which of course will be this same thousand year period of time, and the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His what? Glory. Now remember, when Christ was on earth in His earthly ministry, except for that one time on the Mount of Transfiguration, did He reveal any of His glory? No. No, He didn't reveal His glory. He laid that aside in order to become the God-man who would, of course, go to the cross. But here he is now on the throne of his glory. This is a whole different ballgame. This is when he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. All right? Now look what it says. When the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, which we saw back in Zechariah is going to be on the earth, and we saw in Isaiah 2 that it's going to be capitalized in Jerusalem and all the nations are going to flow into it. Now put all that together. This is all part and parcel of the earthly part of this glorious kingdom on earth. All right, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, you, He says to the eleven, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, ruling or judging who? the twelve tribes of Israel. Now you see, when you put all this together, then Scripture is so logical. You see now why Peter was all uptight when the spot that Judas had abdicated was empty and he thought the king was coming at any moment? How can we have twelve thrones filled if we're only eleven? So what do we have to do? Hey, we've got to get it filled with the twelfth man. And so Peter did. That was his first item on the agenda, if I may put it that way, to get a replacement for Judas. And so they did. They chose Matthias. Because after all, if they're going to rule 12 tribes, they had to have 12 men. And so Matthias fills the slot left open by Judas. Well, all of this just to show that God was promising to the nation of Israel this earthly kingdom and then you come into the book of Acts. I'm not even going to try to get into the heavenly part. We'll wait until our next program for that. But now in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Right down at verse 3. Acts chapter 1, 
verse 3. Now, of course, the Lord's been crucified. He's been resurrected. He's been walking amongst the disciples for 40 days. Verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that is, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and in that whole 40-day period of time, there was really only one topic of conversation, wasn't it? And what was it? The kingdom of God. Now we always have to separate the two terms. Matthew over and over and over says the kingdom of heaven. And here in Acts chapter 1, and it will be again in Acts chapter 28, we have it the kingdom of God. Well, the best way I can differentiate is that the kingdom of God is that whole whole sphere of God's influence, of His sovereignty, whether it's heaven, whether it's outer fringes of space, whether it's hell, whether it's earth, anything that's under God's domain is included in that kingdom of God. Now that's a big subject. I mean, anybody could talk about the kingdom of God for days on end, and so the Lord didn't have any trouble for 40 days. But within the kingdom of God is going to be that glorious kingdom on this planet called the kingdom of heaven. It's just like those of us sitting here in Oklahoma, we're in the United States of America, but we're in Oklahoma. Well, now that's the way I like to like it. All right, now in the 30 seconds I have left, verse 6. Now when they were therefore come together, they asked of him, that is the eleven, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See how plain that is? What kingdom were they talking about? The earthly kingdom over which their Messiah would one day rule and reign. We want to invite you to visit lessfeldick.com where you'll find all our programs available on audio, video, and in book form. You'll also find many of our on-location teaching seminars held across the country, as well as the popular questions and answers book and many other study materials. Just go to lesfeldick.com. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.